Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Mays, and I am the liaison for the Michigan Mental Health Diversion Council, uh, as well as the Diversion Administrator for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And on behalf of the Mental Health Diversion Council, I want to welcome you to the sixth annual Mental Health Diversion Council Pilot Summit. So as you can imagine, uh, this venue is not what we are accustomed to. Um, in years past, we've always uh, met in the Romney building in Lansing. Um, but as a result, we've had to uh, cut our time from a usual six hour event down to 2.5 hours. Um, and we need to be laser focused on uh, the, the recommendations and best practices uh, from the Lieutenant Governor's Joyce Joint Task Force um, on jails and pretrial incarceration and the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice. So what you'll be viewing today is a result of um, those gatherings of information and best practices. Um, it, but the silver lining to all of this is that, the, uh, that this platform affords us the opportunity to open up these proceedings to a larger um, participant base. And so with that in mind, I'd like to welcome all of those uh, who are joining us for the very first time um, to be able to share in this information and all of the wonderful things that are going on in terms of initiatives for jail diversion across the state. Before we get going though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank some folks um, as we move forward. First, the Diversion Council um, for their ongoing work uh, to help pro proliferate all of the jail diversion initiatives uh, that are currently going on around the state. Um, your tireless work uh, has not gone unnoticed, uh, and in fact, uh, you've been called upon by the governor to continue to make recommendations to the executive office, and we will continue to do so um, to, to try to help uh, with continuing efforts with jail diversion. Um, to the pilots, uh, I say thank you. Um, you have become, over the years, a beacon uh, and an inspiration to all of those communities across the state that are continuing to struggle with um, their efforts with jail diversion. Uh, and it is my hope that you will continue even uh, after this year uh, to offer uh, uh, help and assistance to your neighbors and neighboring counties uh, to kind of help them along with, uh, with any of their efforts as well. It's been a, an honor and a joy to work with all of you. Uh, and I, I'm so proud of how far you've come uh, to help fill the gaps in the sequential intercept models um, that we started um, so many years ago. Um, it's been uh, very rewarding to see the progress that you've all made, and I anticipate that you'll continue to continue to make those uh, those strides as we move forward. To all those stepping up communities that are joining us today, I say thank you for your commitment and your realization that um, you need to, to partner with, uh, with other agencies within your community and, and you recognize that all of these issues aren't just foisted upon one agency. You recognize that you need to come together in order to make these changes happen within your community and it's important for you to, to continue uh, as a singular unit to uh, address these jail diversion efforts. And finally, uh, to Wayne State University and the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice uh, and their data and evaluation team who have been with the Diversion Council uh, since the very beginning. Uh, your efforts have been uh, staggering in the amount of data that you've been able to compile and evaluate. Um, and it shows in the reporting that you have um, consistently provided the Diversion Council uh, and in turn, the executive office as well. Um, I'd also like to, to pay uh, a special thank you to the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice's um, Pilot Summit team who have worked <laughs> tirelessly behind the scenes uh, to put on this uh, program. Um, and if you knew the amount of work that they put in, uh, you know it, it's a, a very daunting task to be able to put this together. So your work does not go unnoticed and it is very, very appreciated. So thank you very much. So to kick off the proceedings uh, with opening remarks, uh, it is my extreme pleasure 
to introduce Dr. Deborah Pinels, who is the Medical Director for Behavioral Health and Forensic program, Programs for the Department of Health and Human Services, and who is also a member of The floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that nice introduction. And um, welcome, everybody, to this uh, event. We're really excited for the program that's about to unfold. Uh, we've worked really hard, and the team has put it together to put it in this virtual format uh, so that we can have as many people as possible participate during these unbelievable and trying times. I just want to take note of how hard these times are. Uh, you know, one of the tasks that I have as the, as the psychiatrist who advises on mental health matters for the state is to um, pay attention to all of the issues that are going on in our country related to COVID-19 and around the world. And we're seeing data emerge every day about the strain and stress on everybody, um, with 30% of people in a recent survey reporting depression and anxiety, 11% reporting suicidal ideation, uh, increased alcohol use um, going on. We know there's issues with domestic violence, um, circumstances, and uh, a whole host of other uh, just very complex, uh, complex uh, times that we're all facing. So the fact that you're taking time out to pay attention to this really is important and, and a wonderful tribute to how much you care about what's happening in our world and how uh, I think the people that are listening to this really are invested in trying to make everything, you know, better at the, inter um, at the intersection of behavioral health and justice. We would not be here, of course, without our Diversion Council. It has been a great group. I have been so excited and honored to be able to um, serve on the Diversion Council for the Department of Health and Human Services. And so on behalf of, of DHHS and Director Gordon and Dr. Caldoun, and all of our leadership at DHHS, I wanna say welcome to everybody and to, for, to this event. I also wanna uh, say how grateful I am to all the partnerships that have been born out of the Diversion Council. It is so multi-disciplinary, multi-person, um, multi multi-region. It, it, is, it is really a, a great diverse Diversion Council with lots of input and lots of robust discussion talking about how we can better serve youth as well as adults um, who are facing um, uh, legal, criminal, legal, ju juvenile justice involvement. I um, also want to especially thank the governor's office for supporting the Diversion Council and the work of the Lieutenant Governor and the Chief Justice in the Jail and Pretrial Task Force that took on um, probably more about mental health and substance use than they had imagined when they started looking at the issues facing um, the state of Michigan related to jails and pretrial. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the country that I want to just uh, talk about related to mental health, behavioral health diversion. One is this idea of mental health diversion. Everyone starting to realize we have to really think about substance use as well and with the opioid crisis not at all going away and the methamphetamine crisis picking up. Um, we, are, we are seeing that this substance use is really also a major part of the equation and our partners at CBHJ who have done such a fantastic job collecting the data have told us this as well. But in the, in the behavioral health space, there's a lot happening in crisis services, uh, both in Michigan and nationally. The National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors this year through SAMHSA, through the partnership with SAMHSA, really is pushing out a lot of uh, information related to crisis services. And in Michigan, we have launched an RFP for the MyCal line, which is the crisis and access line. There is uh, the FCC in July passed um, uh, unanimously, the number 988 as a future behavioral health crisis line. And so we're going to see a lot shifting. Uh, there's a lot going on also in the crisis law enforcement interface. And I'm really excited that we have some fantastic law enforcement partnerships and opportunities here in Michigan to build off what we've been doing uh, to date. And you'll hear in the first panel some of the work that's been going on in Michigan that was recognized by the jail and pretrial task force in terms of the education and training efforts uh, to improve practices, both at the law enforcement interface, as well as at the behavioral health and emergency uh, medical services interface, which is really the trifecta when a crisis occurs in the street. 
we know that we have to pay attention to our data and we're so grateful again for CBHJ for having data to look at and look at the issues around race. We know that the, a disproportionate, um, uh, there's a disproportionate representation in both uh, the juvenile and adult criminal system uh, related to persons of color. And that is something that we have to pay attention to. And it's, it's uh, I think, even more relevant for people with uh, mental health and substance use challenges who are also facing healthcare disparities that have been highlighted in the COVID-19 context. We have other things going on in the state that will also change the landscape in the future. We are, we are now a recognized CCBHC demonstration site. This is a certified community behavioral health clinic um, opportunity. And as we roll out more CCBHC initiatives, part of the certified community behavioral health clinic uh, role is to provide an interface at that diversion um, uh, strategic thinking. And so I think we'll see where these clinics uh, become uh, further developed. We have a couple demonstrations already in the state, but as they grow, uh, we're going to, I think we're going to see a lot more conversation related to this. Uh, we are really well poised. We have expertise within the state, which is one of the reasons why it's so exciting to be part of this. Um, you're going to hear a lot about it today. Uh, we have um, come a long way with the Diversion Council with the excellent work of the pilots on the ground and the heroes working in the field every day trying to help individuals who are underserved um, get better outcomes for themselves. And so we have great opportunities and I really want to welcome everybody uh, to, to this event. Um, I just also want to finally say, um, again, in addition to CBHJ, uh, my one of our my great partners has been Judge Milt Mack, who has been the uh, chair now of the Diversion Council, and I want to acknowledge all of his tire, tireless work. Um, people may not realize how much he's been involved, even on the national scene, trying to trying to shape best practices for people with mental health um, and substance use challenges who are at the interface of the legal system. And through his leadership, we have seen Michigan just get on the map nationally in a major way. So I wanna thank him as well. And with that, I think I will turn it over. Thank you, Dr. Pinals, um, very much for that. Um, next up is our first presentation um, by Dr. Aaron Colmartin. Uh, Aaron is the data director for the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice, uh, and will be presenting on uh, data gathering and evaluation. Dr. Colmartin. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for being here today. We're um, really excited to present um, a little bit of a twist on the data that we've presented in the past. Historically at these summits, it's always been showing the excellent work and the progress that's been made by our jail diversion sites. But we wanted to flip it a little bit this year to show what's been happening with stepping up technical assistance. So what we're gonna do here today is show the, the great work, you'll see the great work of the jail diversion sites represented in the data who've been working towards jail diversion and mental health for quite some time. We look at our pilot sites as exemplary communities. And what we try to do is take what they've learned and what we've learned through our data and evaluation and apply it to new communities that are trying to take on this great work. And so here you'll see in these slides um, what we're going, uh, the great work of both. Um, so a little bit of background about Stepping Up for those who don't know, it's a national initiative um, where communities take on the goal of reducing the number of people with mental illness in jails. Um, and you'll see it's been in collaboration with the National Association of Counties, the Council of State Governments, uh, Justice Center, and the American Psychiatric Association. Um, what has happened with this initiative is that we were seeing Michigan communities sign on as a county resolution to do the work of reducing the number of people in jails with mental illness, but there was great leadership and coming together to build collaboration to do it. But what the state found is that there wasn't the capacity or the expertise within these counties to move the initiative along. And so as the center of excellence in the state of Michigan, we were tasked by the Diversion Council and MDHHS to work with these communities to move that needle. 
And so for the current lay of the land, you'll see on this map the counties that have signed the Stepping Up Initiative. And on the, the national website, currently there, it says that there are 24 mission counties who've done so. We are also aware of three additional uh, communities who've signed the resolution that just have not made it up to that level. Um, in 2019, we started working with five partners um, on the Stepping Up Initiative. And in 2020, we've been working with six. And hopefully moving into the future, we have many other interested communities um, that we can work with and partner to do this. What you'll see again in the data is comparison to our pilot um, sites, the jail diversion sites, and how their exemplary, their example has set the stage. So this national initiative is guided by six questions. And the goal of our technical assistance for these sites is to get an answer of yes to all six questions. Um, the process that we do takes between six and nine months, which is broken up into two phases. Um, the first is meeting with key stakeholders and leadership, and observing and assessing the practices that are already going on in the community. Once we provide that data and that information and, and um, our gathering of knowledge about that community, we move into phase two, where we help assist and plan their future movement. A little bit about terminology before we go into the presentation a little deeper is that we, in our work, we use the term serious mental illness a little bit differently than clinicians in the field and or mental health organizations. Because we're assessing individuals as they're coming into the jail, we need to do a very quick screen to assess for mental illness. Again, we're not, uh, it's not a diagnosis as most clinicians uh, see this term. It's a screen and a positive score of nine or higher on the Kessler six screen. Um, is how we determine somebody needing more services. But we've broadened our definition and not gone to the diagnosis because we know that individuals booking into jail have risks for those jails, one obviously being suicide. So getting that quick screen so the jails know who um, they need to be serving is key. Likewise, um, we use substance use disorder differently than clinicians in the field do. Um, again, it's that quick assessment that we screen, or it's the quick screen that we use at jail booking um, to see who needs to go on to get a further assessment or diagnosis. So one of the questions that Stepping Up Initiative asks is, do you have baseline data? And as a research institution, this is something not only are we excited to do, um, but we often like to use with communities to make data-driven decisions. So providing this baseline data as a first entrance into the work that these communities are taking on is really helpful so that they can monitor progress into the future. So one of the key points of data that communities um, need as they start off on these initiatives is what is the prevalence of individuals in their jail who have serious mental illness? And you'll see in our five counties um, to the, on the right side of the screen, you'll see that the range is anywhere between um, you'll see the ranges between 17 and 28 percent. Again, you'll see far on the right that the county, uh, county E has a quite lower rate than the rest of the counties. And this is a community that has um, been working on the initiative probably equally as long as some of the jail diversion sites, but also has a millage to do this work. So they, um, they kind of throw our averages off. So if you don't, uh, if you remove County E, you'll see that the other four remaining stepping up counties have about a 26% um, prevalence rate. And then in compared to our jail diversion pilots, it's a little bit higher. But again, there hasn't been that time to develop best practices and monitor progress into the future as our pilot sites have had. So we're hoping in, in this collaboration within the community to do this work, they um, can move that needle down. Same pattern with substance use disorder. You'll see how jail diversion county, uh, counties are around 55% booking into the jail. Again, County E has a significantly lower score for two reasons. One, they have been focused on this for quite some time, but they also use a different question to assess substance use disorder. So it's uh, not really apples to apples on this slide. But again, you're looking at um, a, a lower prevalence uh, higher prevalence rates if you're looking at the other four communities. And as Dr. Pinels was talking about, looking at not only just substance use in and of itself, but the, the population with co-occurring uh, disorder. 
you're seeing 16% are jail diversion pilots and a range of, uh, you know, around that in the uh, stepping up communities. But not only is mental health, focusing on mental health and substance use separately important, but this population with co-occurring disorder is one that we see often in a criminal legal system with the most needs and the most risks. So knowing that population as um, communities go on to this work is very important. Okay, does the community have, uh, have they conducted a comprehensive process analysis? So this is where we work with the communities to assess how they have historically identified mental illness at, uh, in their jails. So this is different from the K-6 SMI, but it's what the jails use. Some jails use the K-6 to identify, some use one question around suicide, and some use a combination of um, a CMH client or a different, different multiple questions that get to, to their practice. So what we assess is once they're identified in the jail, are they referred to services within the jail and then do they receive those services? And again, comparing the jail diversion sites, you see that the stepping up communities are under identifying and under referring and serving this population. But again, the goal here is to implement best practices so they can make a stronger connection between these numbers and that those who need it, if they're in the jail for a period of time, they're getting those services so that they de don't decompensate. So about length of stay, you'll see, um, we all know that jails are not conducive environments for mental health treatment and decompensation is often seen with this population. So another goal is not only to decrease those who come into the jail, but it's how long are they staying? For those who can be diverted and uh, out to treatment in the community, that's, that's kind of the goal. So in jail diversion, you'll see there is a significant difference in the length of stay in jail between those who the jail identify with mental illness compared to those who don't, 17 days to, compared to 11. And the same pattern exists with the stepping up communities. However, the stepping up communities had an even longer stay than the jail diversion communities with a 21 day average. Do you have timely screening and assessment? So taking those three steps in um, jail diversion or identification, you'll see that from the time someone is booked to the time that they're identified with a mental illness by the jail is pretty much done right at booking or if they go right on to a med uh, medical screen. But from identification to referral, you're seeing an eight day time lag on average. And then from that referral date to receiving service is a seven day. And I should say that this is just our, the averages for our stepping up communities. This does not include jail diversion. And that 16 day period from booking to average date of receipt is within the average length of stay for those with SMI, but it's a considerably long period of time. So working towards reducing those number of days is a key goal in stepping up and jail diversion. Do you track progress? So what we found in our jail diversion work, uh, we found that we actually hadn't been doing this with jail diversion when we started our stepping up technical assistance. And we've gone back to work with all of our communities in the CBHJ to offer this service. As we start to unplug from your communities, the goal of using data to keep tracking progress is really critical to um, the initiative and to the, the best practices in the community. So we have staff that work with IT professionals in these communities to integrate data so that this population can be tracked over time. Um, and it uses the four key measures of the stepping up initiative, which is prevalence rates, length of stay in jail, connection to treatment and recidivism. Have you prioritized policy uh, and funding? So we also have staff members that have gone into the communities to help build their long-term infrastructure and governance structure to do the work of stepping up. And so we've helped um, develop advisory boards and substructures for those communities who didn't have one to begin with, help identify their short and long-term goals using the data reports we've provided. And then as they start off in this work, we offer coaching and give feedback for that advisory board and how they can move out into the future um, to do the work. And one thing that we have done as we've unplugged with, from the communities is think about how we can build the resources to do this work um, long term into the future. And what we've done 
has helped some of these communities create and write grants to fill those gaps and needs for services. So as one other service we'd like to offer in that grant writing process and establishing need in anyone's community, not just our partner communities, is we have started this um, first phase of development of a data dashboard in collaboration with TBD Solutions. And today we'd like to give you a brief intro uh, into how you would might be able to use this dashboard into the future for your work. The Center for Behavioral Health and Justice is excited to offer you a preview of the first phase of our new web-based application. The dashboard compiles data from a number of state and national sources, giving you access to data on demographics, criminal justice, health, socioeconomics, and more, all in one easy to access location. The dashboard allows users to fully customize how they interact with data, finding variables for comparison by searching for keywords or exploring metric categories. You can compare a single county, select a pre-made group of counties, or identify a custom group of counties and select how you would like to aggregate. Comparisons to the state aggregate are automatically included. Viewing multiple variables side by side will allow users to interact with and use data in new ways. Where the data is available, the dashboard will plot a single variable over time. This level of interaction will support users to apply for grants explore data-driven policy, and learn more about Michigan's communities. As an example, studies show that data related to employment or unemployment and housing could be linked to recidivism. So we searched the dashboard for unemployment, jobs, and rent to explore what we could learn to help us demonstrate the need for funding to support jail diversion or deflection programming. As the dashboard continues to evolve, we will add new data sources as they become available, allowing the app to remain relevant to you and your community. As a valued partner, the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice would love your input. If you have access to data that could be included, or you would like to offer feedback to help us build an effective and useful app, please send us an email to connect with the project. So that was the brief introduction. And as I said, this is the first development um, phase and we're, this is not a live dashboard yet, but if anyone is interested in giving feedback on this dashboard and what you would like to see, please send an email to the cbhj at wayne.edu with the phrase data dashboard. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and interactions with the site. Thank you. Thank you, Erin, for that presentation. I'm Liz Talander. I'm the deputy director at the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice. And our team has served as the data and evaluation team for the jail diversion pilot program since 2015. The panel topics for today were selected because they are the four key recommendations made to the diversion council as a result of the work put in in those pilot communities. These recommendations are also reflected in the final report of the Michigan Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration, which in concluded its work in January. A copy of that report is provided under panel one in today's program. I have a few notes that I want to address before we get started. Um, each of today's panels is a firm 30 minutes. We wanna be sure that everyone's out of here on time today. Each panel will include a brief introduction to the topic, a panel discussion and audience Q&A. We encourage you to submit questions during the panel or in advance of a specific panel using the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Following each panel discussion, CBHJ Project Coordinator Lane Putans will moderate the questions. Any questions um, that are not addressed and those that are will be compiled in a separate Q&A document that will be emailed to all attendees, speakers, panelists next week, along with a link of um, the video to today's summit. So please note that today's summit is being recorded. Finally, in an effort to save some time, we have provided a brief bio of all of our speakers and panelists in the program for your reference, so we can save time and not do um, those thorough introductions as we normally would. I'm gonna move into panel number one now. It's called Enhancing Deflection and Diversion for Individuals with Serious Mental Illness. 
We have generally used the term diversion quite broadly to encompass efforts, programs, or interventions at any point on the sequential intercept model that serves to move an individual or divert the individual with a behavioral health concern from the criminal justice system to appropriate treatment. There are actually two distinct terms that refer to these actions depending on when they occur on that sequential intercept model. Deflection is the action taken before an arrest occurs, so we're looking at intercept zero and one, and diversion is an action taken after an arrest has, occur has occurred. So now we're looking at any action from um, sequential intercept one forward to five. Represented on this panel are key behavioral health and criminal legal stakeholders from jail diversion and stepping up counties. They have been selected because of the novel solutions they've implemented within their counties to enhance the deflection of individuals from the jail system. They include Major Troy Goodenough, Monroe County Sheriff's Office, and we hope the next Monroe County Sheriff, Sojourner Jones from Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, and Brian Swicky from Genesee Health Systems. Welcome, panelists. Good morning, thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start off with a couple of questions for our panelists today. And I know, as I said, all of you have implemented some pretty creative um, approaches to deflection. And so if you could each describe the intervention or strategy that you have used to deflect individuals with SMI from your jail. And Major, I'm going to start with you. Um, and I know that many counties have replicated your approach with your referral form. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and uh, first I want to start out by thanking uh, the jail diversion team and obviously Wayne State, uh, Liz and all your staff for all the help that they've given us and the guidance to uh, perfect what I think is a very good model in jail diversion here in Monroe County with behavioral health and substance abuse disorder. Um, after, uh, as you uh, well know, we were chosen as one of the pilots for the diversion program. And as we were training our road patrol officers and our correctional staff in mental health first aid and crisis intervention training, we saw a significant drop in um, individuals with behavioral health disorders coming to our jail. They were being divo diverted just as we had uh, intended. However, uh, I took it upon myself to look further into calls that we were responding to. And when I say we, I refer to our lo local law enforcement community, which not just the Sheriff's Office, Michigan State Police and our local uh, city police and uh, small law enforcement jurisdictions. And I found um, that we were responding to the same residents time after time for non-law enforcement at, um, calls for service. And as we dug a little deeper, we found that really it was um, our services, we were, were not, we couldn't meet the needs of those individuals. And ultimately I found that these individuals at some point in time were becoming uh, inmates in our jail because the officers had nowhere else to turn. And we found in one particular case that we responded to a lady's home 40 times in a matter of three months. That's law enforcement, fire, as well as ambulance service. And I said at that time, we need to divert these people well before they call 911 and get them the help they need. Get the link to the services that they may not know that exist. So what we did is we developed a single page document. Um, we supplied it to all our local law enforcement agencies in a PDF. And essentially the officers respond to this call for service and they're finding it's people that maybe can't take care of their basic needs um, or are on the verge of having a mental health crisis. And we step in, we fill this single page form out, the officer on the road does. Once they complete that, they email it to our local partners, which is our community mental health, which without their help and partnership, we wouldn't be successful in this. They receive that communication and within 24 hours, they send a peer support and a clinician to this residence to meet with these individuals and assess what they need uh, to solve their crisis, whether it's a guardian, um, CMH services. Um, and we found a significant reduction in the calls for service to those homes where we initiated this activity or this document. Thank you so much, Major. So I know that you mentioned um, CMH 
Are there any other partners that were critical to your implementation of that form? Yes, and, and again, and trying to keep everything brief so we stay on track with time. Um, we had to have, we, you know, we had our stakeholder group put together, our members of, uh, from CMH, members from the hospital um, as part of our stakeholder group, our um, substance abuse disorder team here in Monroe County, but each uh, law enforcement representative, we had to bring them in and, and educate them and explain to them what the value is of this process and eliminating them having to, or at least reduce the amount of times that they respond to that home for what I want to categorize as non-law enforcement activities. Um, you know, we found that uh, in a lot of research that we were being more social workers than we were law enforcement driven. Um, and once they were on board, um, they, they were just so happy to see the value in this. And uh, Adam Anastasia is one of our panelists today and he was pulling the numbers for me but I think we're well over 500 deferrals since we had implemented this uh, almost two years ago. Wonderful, thank you so much. We have said at um, the CDHJ for a long time that Monroe County is always, has the disposition of yes, that you always dig in and you make it work. So we appreciate that. We also say at the CDHJ, if you can make it happen in Wayne County, you can make it happen anywhere because of the complexity of Wayne County. So Sojourner, I wanted to hear from you a little bit about the high utilizer um, collaboration that you've had with the local police department in Wayne County. Morning and thank you. Um, you know, downtown Detroit is, the, is our target area and we have a lot of you know, renovation and new people, but we also have a very small population who I call familiar faces. And these are the people who have been planted in downtown when no one else was there. And so with this economic growth, some of our businesses, um, you know, were complaining about a certain population. And so what we decided to do is to develop this familiar face list. And it's just those persons who have been there who we know. And so trying to engage them with services or it just gets finding what their need is, is what our primary goal is. And so we've come together We've identified them. Um, the beauty that I have had is that I've actually co-responded um, with downtown officers. Wayne County has had a co-responder model for 15 years. And so it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to co-respond and then as well as come on this side to divert um, and deflect them from um, going on um, being incarcerated. And so we've identified this list with our local partners, with our um, law enforcement, with our local businesses. Um, in the downtown area to really wrap and see what we can do to assist this population. And believe it or not, it has just been a wonderful opportunity. 65% of them are engaged in services now. Um, we have some who have just disappeared from downtown. And I say that because as I travel along other parts of the city, they just moved, um, but they're not downtown. Um, we've also had some that has you know, gotten housing and so just really meeting people where they, where they are and having that uncomfortable conversation and letting them know their options. So many of them have had bad experiences with just um, entities. And so giving them another opportunity and letting them know, hey, well, you didn't like this um, CMH, let's try another CMH. Um, during the pandemic, um, we were able with Detroit Wayne to um, implement a new crisis stabilization unit in downtown Detroit, as well as have two psychiatric urgent care, which has really helped tremendously in terms of taking them to get services that they need, as opposed to being bombarded in the ED or even going to jail. Um, and so um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Everyone knew them downtown. Everybody knew about this population, but no one was really willing to do anything to step up to see what their need is. And it's just taking that time to have that intimate conversation and meeting them where they are to get them on the right path. Mm -hmm. So Jenna, tell me a little bit about who your partners are with this. I know that you mentioned is that it would be Detroit Police Department. Who else did you work with to identify and then also address these individuals? Um, the beauty of downtown is that, you know, we have the business district and majority mm -hmm. of the businesses wanted to help. 7-Eleven, um, um, believe it or not, DTE, Blue Cross Blue Shield, recognizing that they know that this population need help. And so they were willing to come on board to say, hey, what do we need to do? Um, 
um, uh, Dan Gilbert provides what's considered um, our emergency bag. So they have hygiene kits. Um, sometimes we get bus tickets. Uh, for my population, I tell all the officers, carry a pack of cigarettes because we know this population smokes. 70% of those who suffer from a mental illness smoke. And so just having those little ancillary things to assist has really, really made a big deal. But you cannot do this without having those relationships. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Brian, I'm going to turn to you. I got really excited when I heard about the virtual co-responder program that you're developing in Genesee County. So I'd love to hear more and what you can share with our audience today. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, we have received a grant from the FCC to develop a virtual crisis intervention response team as a ride along with our law enforcement agency. So we'll be providing all of our law enforcement officers with smart devices such as iPads or other such things so that they can immediately contact and have um, uh, the opportunity to speak to a, a certified uh, clinician, uh, MSW, um, at the point of uh, intercept with individuals that may be suffering from a mental illness or a co-occurring disorder, also with substance use disorders. So they'll be able to either get advice or directions immediately and or work with the individual by providing them the screen so that they can um, interact with our, our clinicians. This will be provided 24 hours, seven days a week. And our next step is to make that available throughout the community so anyone can log on you know, at any point. We also have a federally qualified health center and along with now being a certified community behavioral, behavioral health center, we'll be developing a urgent behavioral center where we'll be working directly with the law enforcement to be able to, to then bring them to a standalone center base where we'll have uh, 24 hour staffing with uh, prescribers as well, right there on staff. So that is the Brian, point. Is this with one particular, particular law enforcement agency or multiple? Well, we'll be expanding it to multiple. You know, mm -hmm. uh, initially we usually start with some of the sheriff's department because of our unique relationship with them through jail diversion and then in the city of Flint, um, just because that's where we encountered the majority of, of individuals living with mental illness and or having some of our diversion activities take place. So they'll start those two spots. First, the sheriff, obviously, because they can go countywide and uh, um, city police in Flint, because the, again, that's where the majority of individuals we encounter at this time. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask one more question before we go to our Q&A. And Major, you mentioned the call specifically about the individual with the multiple uh, repeated calls to their home. Um, so Joner, I know that you probably have a story about a deflection or a diversion that keeps you motivated in your work. I know that you are called the fixer, which I loved when I read in your bio. So I'm just going to turn to you and ask you to share a, a story that kind of keeps you motivated where you've seen the work that you're doing pay off. Um, thank you. I know within our precincts, we get a large number of those persons who make reports. Um, you know, someone, there's a circus in my closet or someone stole all the, you know, cut all the tips of my socks off. And so I remember this one senior citizen where we went to um, and she was very, very scared. And you can tell that, you know, she hadn't been taking care of herself. And so the detective, you know, he said, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, we got to take care of her. And so when I went in there, the young um, senior citizen said, you know, um, you can't come in here because they're going to get you. I said, look, you know, she was concerned about a zoo in her closet. I said, um, you know, I'm a zookeeper and I have special powers and watch what I can do. And she looked, I said, I, I guarantee you, if somebody come out here, then I'm going to take you with me. And the officer just stood there. And so I went and I knocked on the door and I said, look, you cannot be in this woman's house. She lives here. How dare you take over her? And the woman was just sitting there and she was like, oh my gosh, this is really working. I said, look, I told you. And then I told her, I said, if you let me do this for you, then you have to do something for me. And so again, it's, I just saw that connection in her eyes. She started crying and just seeing how someone took the time to come to her house 
to see a need that she had being met, it just instantly just turned her whole thought process around. And I was really able to get her to connect it with services prior to COVID. They came into her house. They connected her back up with not only um, mental, but medical services as well and food. And so it just really helped because she had contacted the department again, 43 times within three months about this zoo being in her closet. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure everybody in this work has that story. And we really appreciate what you're doing above and beyond the traditional model to help those in crisis. Lane, I'm going to turn it over to you for our question and answer session. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, panelists. We do have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so first one, a quick question for you, Brian. Someone is wondering if the urgent care center you talked about is limited in the amount of time a person can stay. Is it a 23 hour facility or can they stay um, longer than that? So, so the facility that we have identified has wings to it. So one of the wings will be a 23 hour setting where people can kind of sit and, and get medications, be um, observed by peers and, and clinicians while they, they work through some of their, their issues through uh, um, solution focus or brief therapy um, at that time. However, it also has wings that we're developing, so you'll be able to move into the CRU, a crisis residential unit, or a sobriety facility. Our sobriety facility is a place where individuals who are intoxicated under substances can, can spend 23 hours, you know, um, basically to, to sober up or, or or come down from whatever drug they are on. We have found by providing that service, we have reduced a large number of domestic violence cases. Obviously people coming home who are intoxicated often um, are not fully capable of, of controlling their anger and temp, temp um, and therefore the police are often called. So this will be provided as well within there. Our idea and hope is to also have a subacute detox center within that facility as well. Great, thank you. All right, another question that probably applies to all of you. Someone is wondering how you educated and what sort of training was provided to all the different collaborators involved in these new diversion and deflection approaches, such as law enforcement, dispatch, um, other folks who are involved. So if anyone wants to address that. We provided all law enforcement um, officers with uh, a mental health first aid training. So they get that as well as additional training. We're working on psychological first aid and some other trainings as well. And in, in Monroe County uh, as well, we provide um, all of our correctional staff with mental health first aid. We had a representative from each department attend one crisis intervention training. We plan on holding additional classes next year with the goal to have a significant number of our uniform law enforcement trained in CIT. And our central dispatch also participates in that training. And we hand out a three page document that kind of outlines um, the encounter or what you're going to encounter and how to handle those situations uh, and to uh, solicit compliance uh, and explain to the individual about once we leave how someone from CMH will be responding that are professionals in this area to help them. And kind of like Sojourn said, it's building that relationship with these individuals and um, their confidence that we're there to help them and not take them to jail and remove their freedom. In Wayne County, we instituted the same. Um, we did do, um, for our new recruits in the academy, they get mental health first aid training. So that's a little bit different. And then also we do kind of like a scavenger hunt um, in terms of the resources in your back door. Um, it is very important as um, the, um, the law enforcement officer Troy said that um, you find you know what's in your own back door and you have to develop those relationships and know who the contact person is at that given time because when someone is ready for treatment, it's not if what you're gonna do, you have to be able to call or take them and say, hey, George, I got this guy, can you take him now? And you go from there. Absolutely, thank you. So Junior, another question for you. Someone is wondering if you can explain a little bit more about how you work specifically with those local convenience stores and businesses around uh, diversion and deflection. 
Um, uh, um, the beauty of downtown is that most of the officers have been there for a while and they visit and, and buy from the stores frequently. And so in our downtime, that's what we do. We go and talk to them um, and let them know what we're here to do, what we're trying to do. And they were just amazed that it was even someone in the downtown area able to help this population and, and wanted to know what they can do. Um, and so it's just, and when you have some free time, even though I know it's not a lot, you have to take that time to go and develop and find out who the owners are, who the store managers are um, when you get a chance. Great, thank you. All right, question for any of you. Are local fire or EMS directly involved in these deflection conversations or in the work itself? In Monroe County, that yes. Um, we actually met with our local fire chiefs and explain to them what our goal and objectives were so that when they arrived on scene or if they arrived on scene, the law enforcement officer, they knew what to expect. It's a continuous um, training module and we're hoping that in 2021 to really bolster that and meet with each fire department individually uh, and cover a number of training topics from substance abuse disorder, behavioral health and Narcan. Same in Wayne County, we've trained our um, fire EMS and mental health first aid and, and suicide prevention. And um, they also, and the EMS, they also are aware. Mm -hmm. And our officers tr have Narcan on site. And so that has helped out a whole lot. And, and we've done the exact same. We've mm -hmm. trained them. We've provided the Narcan kits to all of law enforcement as well as first responders. And our hope with the virtual crisis uh, response team will be to expand that to all first responders. So the fire and ambulance drivers will be um, given pads at some point as well. Wonderful, thank you. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, I know some of you mentioned some numbers and outcomes with your initiative. I'm wondering if you can share how you measure the success and efficacy of these programs and what sort of data you track to look at outcomes. So, so with, be, with behavior ahead. health, I have the opportunity to see within our own database um, if they are billed or, or claimed for them. I also have alerted in their charts. So if they come in contact with the emergency department or any crisis stabilization unit, I am called. <laughs> and so I am able to monitor a little bit closely because I actually get the calls and um, actually able to divert from inpatient hospitalization, which has in the, in the ED, they love because they know this population does not need inpatient. They need more community services support. And in Monroe, kind of along those same lines, we um, know who we have frequent contact with. And you know, we can give you a plethora of names where we were responding multiple times. Those people are no longer on the grid. And, and we even have officers come in that said, what happened to so-and-so? We haven't had any contact with him or her in such a long time and they find out they're in diversion or they're doing different things and you know that goes back to what was the panel one of the questions the panelists asked that's what drives us is when you have those folks that are now productive members of society that stop by the the jail or you bump into them in the community mm -hmm. and they say you know i'm so happy that you know i'm i'm 36 years old and for 18 years i was it wasn't a year that gone by i didn't i wasn't a resident of the jail and now I'm clean, I'm a productive member of society, I'm providing for my family, I'm now reunited with my children, um, life is good. That's what drives us and we know that's the right thing to do in society is we're not just law enforcement officers anymore. We wear a number of different hats and if we wanna change the culture, we wanna change the outcomes in our country, we have to understand that concept. Thank you. And Genesee, I, I just uh, echo that sentiment because I think um, so many of these individuals were invisible. They weren't part of our community. They weren't residents of, of, of our neighborhoods. Um, and now today I see them walking down the middle of the hallway, talking with the sheriffs and, and the law enforcement, with judges and prosecuting attorneys. And, and I, I guess, you know, when you see somebody not hide in the corners anymore, but out in the light, it, it, it is what drives us all and continues and i uh, been doing it for a very, very long time and, and I'm still surprised every time I see somebody new um, come, come in to become a full, 
pledge member of our community. Wonderful, thank you. Liz, I'll pass it back to you to move on to our next panel. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, panelists, Major, Sojourner, and Brian. We really appreciate your time this morning. We're going to move to panel number two now, which is behavioral health and crisis response training for law enforcement. Behavioral health and crisis response training has been a focus of law enforcement agencies for decades. The goal of most models is to equip officers with an effective response to behavioral health crises that they are often not aware of before arriving on the scene. CIT, Crisis Intervention Team, has been long been considered the gold standard in this training, but for some communities, CIT can be time and cost prohibitive. Further, it's recommended that 20 to 25 percent of a force receive CIT training, but what about the rest of the force? This morning, before beginning our panel, we wanted to provide an update on the state's efforts around law enforcement training. Law enforcement training has been in the spotlight since the murder of George Floyd in late May. In June, Governor Whitmer authorized MCOLS to, among other things, take specific steps directed at reform, including um, directing the Diversion Council to make recommendations on best practices and training for law enforcement agencies when responding to situations involving persons with mental illness. Here to provide an update on the work undertaken by MCOLS and the Diversion Council, is the executive director of MCOLS, Tim Burgoyes. Welcome, Director Burgoyes. Appreciate that. Um, thank you for the introduction. Just a couple of comments here as we begin this panel. Um, first of all, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning and, and talk to all of you. I bring maybe a little bit different perspective to this. I spent 41 years in local law enforcement. I was very lucky to work in an area that was pretty progressive in the area of uh, collaboration regarding behavioral health and, and mental health treatment. And so that gave a, a good foundation. I was also really lucky throughout my career to be asked to, to serve in, in various places like with the Diversion Council. So it gave me a, a perspective of what others were doing and, and what was possible. Um, and, and now in my present role at the state level where we set standards for law enforcement training and uh, we provide some funding for law enforcement training, and there's an ongoing discussion on some, some bills in the legislature about increasing um, our responsibility and authority in that area. And so this, this all comes together at a, at a very good time. So it allowed me to see kind of what worked or in some cases what didn't at both the local and, and a state level. It would not be appropriate for us to have this discussion without acknowledging, as Liz did, um, you know, the spark that kind of kicked off this discussion that we're having right now. I'll be the first to say it, it may not always be fair. It is very passionate and it is very understandable. Um, law enforcement tends to um, get probably more of the focus, um, more of the credit, and more of the blame for what goes on. It's, it's to many the most visible form of, of government. And it's a very, very difficult, very complicated job. And as the major said, um, you know, law enforcement officers are asked to do so much now. Um, when we send a recruit out of, a, out of the basic academy before they've had field training or, or anything, um, we identify about six to 800 uh, pieces of knowledge, skill, and, and ability, and, and, and things that they have to be able to demonstrate to do just to walk out the door of that academy. And they need to do that all in some very, very difficult uh, situations. So while this might not be fair, this is an opportunity. And, and as someone once famously said, you, know, you don't waste a, a crisis, you, you look for opportunity. And while many of us have worked for a long time seeking resources to help us in these areas and not always found those resources, this is an opportunity to do that. So law enforcement um, now, and probably for the foreseeable future, remain the people that you call when you have no idea who else to call. But law enforcement has never done that alone, and we never will do that alone. And this highlights this opportunity to enhance in many areas, or in some places, frankly, create those partnerships that need to be created. Um, for us to all do our jobs, um, we can all either help each other do our jobs, or we can all be impediment to doing those jobs. And so, so law enforcement, EMS, community mental health, 
all sorts of folks come together uh, and provide those resources that, that we need to, to jointly uh, engage in to, to provide this opportunity. This, I, I also have to say, is an opportunity, hopefully, to help educate our political leadership. They're a reflection of society, and our society has a very short attention span. Um, we tend to identify a problem. It tends to blow up in social media. Um, we allocate one-time money. We declare the problem fixed, and we move on. And we move on, and, and, and we know that it, who have worked in this area for so long. This requires long-term relationships. It requires long-term policy. Um, it requires long-term funding. And, and that's incumbent on all of us to help educate our political leadership uh, to those things. So the executive office of the governor reached out to us, as Liz mentioned, and said um, a couple of things. Um, the, the, the Michigan Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration did quite a bit of work in a short period of time. And one of their recommendations, recommendation seven, was to enhance behavioral health training for law enforcement. And they said, what can you do in this area? And thanks to our already existing and ongoing relationships with the Diversion Council, we were aware of three excellent programs, not to say there aren't others, but three excellent programs that were up and running in the state already. Um, MISIS, Managing Mental Health, and CIT, all of which provided a platform. And usually when you get these kind of asks, you don't have a lot of time to develop it. And, and that was the case here. So it, it just underscores the uh, requirement to have those existing relationships in place. So at this point, uh, the governor's uh, executive request to the legislature for the fiscal year 2021 includes $3 million to help enhance that training for law enforcement officers. Now we have about 19,000 in-service law enforcement officers. Um, and we deal with them both at the academy level before we come, they come out and then once they get in service. This money would be targeted toward the in-service providers, um, the, the existing officers right now. And it represents what we would estimate to be about 50% of the cost. So we've made them keenly aware of that. Now we all know that the budget is, uh, is a, a, to, to be charitable a work in progress at this point. Um, however, the, the governor remains firm in her ask for this money, and, and we're now uh, in discussions with the legislature to see where that goes. So this is a great start, but I would, I would, uh, I would emphasize this is only a start. This allows us to focus on those relationships and partnerships to holistically address the problem uh, and, and, and challenges of behavioral health. Um, th this won't by any means solve it. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna keep you up, um, Director Burgoy, so in case there are any questions that you can be available to answer at the end of our panel discussion. The next panelists represent th the three primary training models that are available within the state that Director Burgoy mentioned. Um, Megan Taft is here representing Summit Point Community Mental Health. And she also um, works very hard on a CIT model. Um, Eric Waddell is with the Cardinal Group 2, and he is focused on managing mental health crisis training. And then Dr. William Fales is um, with EMS and Disaster Medicine at Western Michigan University Medical School. And he is one of the folks behind MISIS. So welcome panelists. We wanted to start off um, with a brief description from each of you. We know at the center that each of these models has some unique characteristics. And as I mentioned earlier, we know that um, CIT is the gold standard and it has its place certainly in training. Um, but we know that MISIS and Managing Mental Health Crisis also have their role. So I'm gonna ask each of you to provide a brief description of those unique characteristics of your training modalities. So I'll start with you, Megan, um, with, with CIT. Thank you, and thanks so much for having me today. So I think um, what I wanna start out with and highlighting with CIT is that our goal of our training and our program is to create systemic community change. So it's often heard, and, and probably you all probably know, is that the T in the acronym CIT is the most important letter. So in Calhoun County, and it stands for team. So in Calhoun County, 
our team consists of local hospitals, the VA, NAMI, prosecutor's office, um, dispatch, summit point, and, and multiple law enforcement agencies. And we meet regularly to, to discuss our data that uh, we gather from our CIT reports to determine what changes and impacts our systems can have on the interventions with individuals uh, with experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, in addition to our team, we also use our local um, experts to train our officers. So um, you've also probably heard the quote, CIT is more than just a training. That was from Sam Cochran, uh, the found, one of the founders of CIT. And so um, we have our local experts uh, who come in and, and provide this training. So that really allows our officers to establish these different connections within our community. Um, in addition, after that 40 hour training, this program continues. So it is, it, we really look at it as a program, meaning, you know, we have regular conversations with our officers. We communicate with CIT newsletters and uh, program, we do local program reviews where we bring back our CIT officers quarterly and hold two hour sessions where we will discuss advanced training topics, case discussions and officer wellness. Um, as a CIT coordinator, I regularly receive contact from our officers to really provide that support and follow up. So again, it goes, it goes the 40 hour training while it's intense and, um, uh, you know, really a benefit to officers. It does go beyond, beyond that as really a program that we work hard at every day. So we have seen so much impact from the implementation of CIT to our community since we did, we did so in 2017. Um, we have we have trained a little over 61 officers. So again, I know we talked earlier, we heard from some other counties that are of a scalable size larger than, than Calhoun. But here, you know, what we've seen just in, in three short years is that we've had over 850 CIT contacts since that time, and we, we do record these. Um, of those contacts, 150 of them had a chargeable offense when the, when the law enforcement officer had contact with the individual, yet only nine of those individuals were taken to jail out of the 850. So that is a stat that we are super proud of here. 94% um, of the calls were resolved without use of force. And um, the use of force numbers that we do record were mostly involving an individual being placed in handcuffs. Um, and so those are just some, you know, some stats that we have that we're proud of. Again, it, it, I think we look at this more as really a program that we continue to focus on and we look at in our community, how do we, how do we help these officers um, who are asked to go to these calls, who again, you've kind of heard from already, may not always be the most appropriate responses, um, but are placed in those situations. So how do we help uh, support them in different ways? And, and maybe change some processes that we've done in the past that, that just aren't helpful. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. And you know, the CBHJ is really excited when we hear that you're tracking your data. So <laughs> of course, that. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to hear from um, you, Eric, about um, your training modality and talk a little bit as Megan did about the unique characteristics that are available in managing mental health crisis. Thanks, Liz. Um, managing Mental Health Crisis, uh, it's a two-day training curriculum. Uh, it's co-taught by a law enforcement and mental health professional, um, and it aims to prepare officers in the field to respond safely uh, to crisis and gain familiarity with uh, mental health options, thereby you know, promoting diversion and, and deflection. Um, our curriculum incorporates case-based video scenario reviews, role plays, de-escalation strategies, and then some other exercises such as like a hearing voices exercise. Um, but the, uh, the consistent message throughout the two-day training is the, uh, it's the cultivation of strong partnerships between uh, the law enforcement community, um, community mental health, and other stakeholders in the sequential intercept. Uh, in fact, uh, agencies are encouraged to invite others uh, within their sequential intercept to train with the officers. Uh, so this creates opportunities for relationship building, uh, better understanding uh, of, of processes within their community beyond their immediate duties. And, and on a lot of occasions, what we found is, is we see a lot of creative problem solving just by bringing all these folks together into the room. 
Um, so in one example, uh, you know, we had a, a community mental health uh, professional in a training and she was talking about, I really wish I knew if my clients had law enforcement contact, because I know this is going to surprise everybody. Uh, clients don't often say, hey, I had police contact last night. They don't really offer up that information. And there just happened to be a dispatch supervisor in the room who said, you know, I have all that data. I can just send it to you every morning. And so it was a quick solution, improved the community, you know, um, just with, with a discussion, just by having these people together um, in the room. And so these create a problem solving um, uh, opportunities that come for this uh, result in improved safety, uh, service and resource alignment. Uh, I think it should be said, you know, as part of the design, uh, managing mental health crisis was designed to support CIT. So we fully acknowledge CIT is the gold standard, and we acknowledge some of the uh, um, some of the other concerns that come with, you know, not everybody can go through a 40-hour model. It's just not feasible operationally and financially. Uh, so the the role as we see managing mental health crises is, is to fill that gap for for staff to support that larger CIT team. Um, so a two-day curriculum uh, that every officer, every employee can go through, and as a result of it, that they can better support that CIT team that has that higher level of training. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for getting to that, my next question. So I appreciate that. I wanna to go to Dr. Fales and hear a little bit about MISIS. Good morning. Um, thanks for the uh, opportunity to be uh, here this morning. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the summit and uh, tell you a little bit about MISIS. Um, just a, a quick, a brief uh, disclaimer. I think this was on the, uh, on the slide, but I, I do have a couple of different hats. Uh, I'm here this morning representing kind of my, not really the day job, but um, my full-time position as a professor of emergency medicine at Western Michigan uh, University School of Medicine. Um, I also have the privilege of serving as a state medical director for the MDHHS uh, division of the MS and trauma. So my comments this morning are primarily from the perspective of uh, WMED and not necessarily uh, the Department uh, of Health and Human Services. Um, so um, the Michigan Crisis Intervention System, or, or we call MISES, was uh, created back in 2017 by Western Michigan University School of Medicine in pretty close collaboration with the MDHHS uh, Division of EMS and uh, Trauma. MISES was um, initiated and funded uh, by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund uh, the request uh, uh, to us was to create an educational program on, be, on response to behavioral emergencies that was inclusive of all, all responders, including law enforcement, EMS, and others. They wanted a program that used contemporary uh, methodologies. Uh, uh, they wanted to exploit instructional technology, uh, distance learning, and uh, they wanted to be accessible to a wide array of responders, including those in rural areas and uh, to volunteers and part-time personnel. <laughs> MISIS was initially, um, uh, was, was created as an integrated family of courses. And we, as we describe it, we talk about both horizontal and vertical integration. Uh, the horizontal integration just simply means that uh, it's intended to uh, encompass the uh, the continuum of, of behavioral response um, system, uh, including disciplines, not just from law enforcement and EMS, but also on the front end from uh, the 911 call takers. Uh, uh, we have uh, include uh, training opportunities for school resource and security officers, correctional officers, and uh, kind of on the back end, uh, hospital emergency department personnel. The, the vertical integration involves uh, designing a curriculum that provides a, a, a kind of a core universal foundation uh, for crisis response concepts that all responders take, and then to build upon that through um, more advanced discipline specific courses. In designing uh, MISIS, we attempted to identify kind of the best practices uh, that were uh, out there at the time to try and make it as evidence-based as possible. Um, uh, with no question, uh, MISIS was is heavily influenced by uh, CIT model curriculum. Um, in fact, we, we just recently did a crosswalk of uh, MISIS with the Department of Justice's best practices CIT curriculum. We found uh, we had just over 95% uh, alignment with the DOJ CIT objectives. Um, 
beyond CIT, uh, we felt it was important to include other important elements uh, that aren't always captured in the CIT uh, that we felt reflected kind of a best practice approach, including trauma-informed uh, care, uh, Columbia suicide severity rating scale and implicit bias training and, and also veterans in crisis. MISIS uses a flipped classroom instructional model in which participants uh, complete two online distance learning courses, uh, one providing that universal foundation, that's our awareness course. The other is um, a discipline specific course that uh, we call Operations One. Ideally, the, these two preparatory courses then are followed by a one day, uh, eight hour Operations Two course, which involves rotating participants in groups of two or three through a series of 12 30 minute stations. Each station is, uh, has a certain, certain theme, uses instructional technique we call enhanced reality based training that uh, uses a role player at most of the stations to simulate certain crisis conditions. That, uh, this allows for um, the knowledge intervention that was hopefully acquired during the online courses to be applied in some fairly stressful scenarios. We refer to that as kind of stress inoculation and we find that to be a pretty valuable approach. <clears throat> We'd love to have everyone do the two-part <clears throat> flip classroom with online followed by, <clears throat> excuse me, in-person training. The reality is that's not always possible. And we, we you know, the, the nice thing with MICE is, is the online program we feel is a strong benefit to uh, responders. Even if you just take the online course, even just the awareness course, uh, we feel that it'll be you better at your, your day job or your night job than, than uh, certainly not having training at all. And it's certainly widely available. Um, so currently the, the funding uh, that was initially provided by the Health Endowment Fund uh, has been completed. That grant's been completed. The charge there was really to develop the course, not to sustain it. Uh, we've also had a supplemental grant from Michigan Department of Military and Veterans Affairs that also has been exhausted. So uh, we are at a funding uh, lull right now with, with MISAs. The awareness and online operations course, um, those continue to be available at no charge. Um, and even this year, we've had a couple hundred uh, responders so far in 2020 that have taken those courses. The in-person course is available to local communities and regions. Um, WMEG can help support that, but uh, Unfortunately, the, the costs have to, have to be absorbed by, at the local level currently. We're hoping that uh, as we move forward, we'll have opportunities to uh, make this more the hands-on course, which is pretty intense and uh, relatively costly compared to the online course, make that more readily available at the local, at the local level throughout Michigan. Uh, we're also excited about the opportunity to kind of partner and see how we can collaborate with these other courses and really provide a good educational solution for uh, Michigan's responders, not just law enforcement, but really the whole, the whole system. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Fails. I will be sure that we include links to each of these programs um, in our Q&A addendum that we'll send out next week, but I want to save a couple of minutes for some questions. I have a feeling that there will be some questions for this panel. So Lane, I'm going to turn that over to you. Thank you. All right. First, I have a question for Megan. Wondering where the funding came from to train the 61 officers in CIT. I think that's always the question with CIT is about funding. So um, thank you for the question. And I will tell you that we had zero funding in Calhoun County for the first three times that we hosted a CIT training. And um, really it was, the cost was quite minimal when you include your community in the, in the process. So as I said, we pulled our local presenters and experts to do that. Um, we were able to get locations donated in kind um, it's amazing when you say you're training law enforcement who will donate lunch. Um, but that's all, you know, that's how we brought it together. The biggest cost is the time of the officers. And um, I think getting to a point, as I, as I stated earlier with those stats, getting officers and, and departments to start to realize the impact or maybe other areas where they are saving costs. Um, you get more buy-in with your future trainings. Now, we were recently awarded a DOJ grant that, that has allowed us to expand our program, um, expand who we're training from corrections officers. We're, do, we're doing a specific training for CIT for youth, and it does also help pay for 
um, some additional funding for officers to be with when in our courses. But in the past, um, it was just departments finding the value and, and again, allocating their funds uh, to have officers complete the course. Great, thank you. All right, question for any and all of you. Um, how have you adapted trainings during the COVID pandemic? Are they being offered virtually or in person still, a combination? What does that look like for all of you? Well, I, I can, <clears throat> the one thing that's nice with the online training with MICE is that component of MICE is, is um, that kind of addresses that. So uh, it was actually kind of nice to see people still taking that. And uh, um, we have not been able, able to have any in-person training. Um, I think because of the small group, two or three responders with uh, usually one or two uh, uh, mock patients and an instructor, I think that's, that's, practical when it's feasible now. I think we're, we're starting to get back into that type of training, uh, of course, provided we all have the right PPE. Um. Yeah, and just to echo a little bit of what Dr. Fail said, you know, in order for us to do effective classroom-based training, adult-based um, learning, um, uh, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, um, uh, locked down with COVID because, you know, obviously the health, well-being, uh, and safety of our participants and our instructors is, is, is paramount. Uh, so we have, uh, with MMHC, we have suspended classroom training until we can do so, and we're confident that we can do so safely. Uh, we are exploring virtual classroom um, opportunities uh, right now, live virtual classrooms to try to try to mirror the classroom experience as best we can, uh, but that's a work in process. And we are moving forward with in-person training. Um, our class sizes are a lot smaller. We've taken a lot of different precautions. We've adjusted um, some of the ways that we've trained historically. Um, and it will be all in person at this point. Part of that was feedback from law enforcement with some preference to do it in person. Um, and so we are moving forward again more frequently with just smaller classes and a lot of different precautions um, in place. Thank you. All right, we have time for one last question. This is another question for all of you. Um, to what extent are jail staff included in these trainings in addition to road patrol? So I can speak on behalf of managing mental health crisis. Uh, we um, highly encourage their involvement in every class. So as you know, as, as I mentioned in our model, we ask them to bring in partners and stakeholders throughout their sequential intercept to, to train alongside law enforcement and corrections is a big piece of that. Uh, and we've had some really great results. Um, just because they, they come in and they see it from a different, from a different position in, in the criminal justice process. Um, and so, yes, we, we strongly encourage it. Uh, we've had some really good feedback from it. And yeah, it's been, it's been really good. In our program, our jail staff often um, will present uh, as a, they'll pr provide some information and usually present on some topic and then um, in addition, like I said earlier, we many CIT programs have trained um, within their corrections. We haven't yet locally in uh, Calhoun County, but with this new G DOJ uh, grant and initiative, we are able to expand uh, to our corrections officers. So uh, staff will be highly involved with that training as well. And same, uh, MICE is, uh, we have in our operations, two, our operations one online course uh, a module or a course specific for correctional officers and um, we've had a number of correctional officers participate in the online operations two course where they're integrated with law enforcement and EMS and that always makes for a richer experience anytime you get. Oh, I think you muted yourself. Yes, I have. Sorry. <laughs> uh, just we, we combine with uh, uh, for ops to uh, we've had correctional officers participate in um, the uh, ops to in-person training and working side by side with law enforcement and EMS. Wonderful. Thank you all. I'll turn it back to you, Liz. Thank you, Megan, Eric, Director Burgoy, and Dr. Fails. We appreciate your time this morning. I'm going to move now to panel number three, which is standardized screening for mental health and substance misuse in Michigan jails. 
a little bit about this topic. Um, all of our jail diversion and stepping up counties know that the re recommendation you can expect from the CBHJ is the implementation of standardized screens at jail intake. A standardized screen is one that has been tested and proven to reliably predict the presence of a problem. Today, we're gonna to talk about um, and focus on mental health and substance use screens. Currently, screening practices across Michigan's 83 county jails are not consistent and most do not use standardized measures. What we initially see um, when we go into the jails is that there are a few questions that when answered yes, will serve as a flag to a booking officer to refer the individual for further assessment. But this practice will often overlook individuals who may not answer yes or who may not have the outward symptoms of psychological distress. We recommend standardized screens because they offer the most objective method of identifying at-risk individuals. When implemented in tandem with correction officers' eyes and ears, a standardized screen can serve to prevent violence, withdrawal, and other risks in the jail. Represented on this panel are behavioral health and criminal legal stakeholders from jail diversion and stepping up counties. They have varying degrees of experience with standardized screens and can offer us some understanding of the obstacles and challenges associated with implementing a screen, as well as some of the compelling reasons for pushing through those issues. Today's panelists include Anna, Adam Anastasoff from Monroe County Mental Health Authority, Lieutenant Derek Gaylord from Charlevoix County Jail, and Renee Wilson from Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office. Welcome panelists. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. So I wanted just to go quickly through the, um, each of you to talk about what validated screens are currently in use um, at jail intake in your jail. So I'll start with you, Adam, and we'll go down the, uh, down the row. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so at Monroe County Jail, we've, um, <laughs> we've implemented this, the, the use of the K-6 as our go-to standardized uh, screening tool. And then we've also implemented the RODS uh, uh, most recently. Uh, the K-6 uh, has proven to be very, very helpful. Um, as you stated, it is standardized. It's quick and easy. Uh, it's, um, it's easy to get law or to get the correction staff on board with implementing the tool. Uh, Major Good Enough was able to get this embedded into the jail management system, which has been uh, hugely helpful. And, uh, and it's been part of the standardized booking process in the Monroe County Jail for quite, quite some time now. Uh, I think about five years. And so we've been able to pull a lot of really quality data from that. It helps us to, uh, to, to triage uh, the needs within the jail on a daily basis. And, um, and then the RODS uh, does the same as well. It's not quite yet embedded into the GMS system, but it will be here shortly. Thank you so much, Adam. And I will return to you in a couple minutes with some other questions. I know that you have, as you said, had those screens um, at the jail for a long time. So I think you can be helpful to this conversation. Lieutenant mm -hmm. Gaylord, tell us a little bit about what's going on in Charlevoix County Jail in terms of screens. Sure, um, we're also currently using the uh, K-6 uh, information. And we're in the middle of a uh, transition to a new jail management software. And we're gonna be including that, building it directly into that. So that'll be easier to track. Also as part of that, we're going to be uh, collecting anybody that's a positive SMI flag and electronically transmitting the approved data uh, directly to our uh, community mental health partners uh, for two things. They can check their system to see if the individual that's incarcerated is already uh, a client of theirs and also to notify their, the jail liaison uh, of individuals that uh, um, need to be seen at the facility. And like all jails in Michigan, we have mandated questions for medical and mental health background as part of our intake process. But going through the stepping up program, we learned that using the K-6, it identified uh, additional individuals that were not identified through our other means, including staff observation. Um, amazingly, it was a larger number of the female uh, incarcerated individuals um, that we didn't realize. 
and through discussions during our stepping out process uh, with Wayne State, uh, we learned that basically uh, females are less forthcoming uh, with information. So having a tool like the K-6 uh, further uh, gives us some ability to provide not only services, but also allow the staff to, you know, keep a closer eye on somebody that we may not have been aware needed a little extra attention. So we're looking forward to it. Obviously Monroe County is much farther along, but uh, we're excited about the process and we appreciate the uh, efforts of uh, Wayne State the program. Thank you. Well, you really are you know, singing music to our ears because we love that you took the data and actually took action with it. So thank you for doing that. And thank you to Sheriff mm -hmm. Bond for endorsing that as well. Absolutely. Um, Nay, I'm going to move to you to talk about what's going on in the Washtenaw County Jail in terms of screening. Thanks, Liz. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So similar to what uh, my colleagues have already spoke about or about uh, screening in the booking process, we have a few different screens that, that we use here in Washtenaw County. We're in the process of enhancing our MOUD program within the jail. So we're going to um, implement the RODs with our medical booking screening. Uh, to help us better identify those folks that might specifically benefit from MOUD, MOUD treatment. Um, we, at the time of booking, as part of our standard booking process, it is implemented into our jail management system, as you've heard mentioned before. We're currently using the GAIN screen, it's the Brief Mental Health screen, as well as the TCUDS, which is the Texas Christian University screen that identifies issues or concerns around substance use disorder. Um, and then those two screens combined are passed on to our in-house uh, team to review, um, go through and compare to previous bookings or previous information that we might have on folks, um, and then kind of take it to the next step when we can actually engage folks one-on-one -on -one and do uh, additional assessments as needed. Last year, um, we did partner with the Wayne State team and we did an evaluation study and compared our gains and our TCUS results to uh, K-6, um, and we were able to, to identify additional folks through the use of the K-6 screen than what we were getting on the GAINS and the T-CUDS. Again, primarily, uh, we saw an increase around our female population and being able to better identify uh, those folks through the K-6. So we are in the process of developing and rolling out our training for all staff around the K-6, uh, and we'll be moving forward and transitioning to that screen shortly. Thank you so much. And again, we appreciate you looking at the data and making those corrections. And we, we endorse the brief jail mental health screen and the K-6, but we know um, that the K-6 is better at identifying those concerns among women. So thank you for doing that. Um, you, you each touched a little bit on it, but I wanna step back because I think it's important to recognize how the screen fits into your overall process. So once the booking offers, officers have conducted those screens, what are you doing with those results? And how does that um, work within your jail? And how does that result in referral or service of those individuals? So Renee, I'll start with you this time and we'll work back through the row. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we have an interdisciplinary team within our jail. It's our reentry services team and it consists of uh, mental health professionals, SED professionals, correction staff, medical staff, at reentry team uh, case managers, and all of our screens are printed off and handed to um, uh, that reentry team. And the reentry team goes through, as I mentioned, they obviously start with those that have flagged positive on any of those screens and start to work through those individuals for additional assessments needed. But we also look at those that didn't flag positive uh, to see, as I mentioned, if we have kind of any previous um, mm -hmm. Uh, connections or involvement or engagement with folks that we're able to kind of pull back history uh, and reconnect with. Um, because the one thing that we know that is challenging for, you know, any screening tool instrument done at the time of booking is you don't always get accurate results. People are not always in uh, the best state, uh, the best, uh, you know, position to answer screens truthfully and honestly or consistently. Um, and so for us, it's really important to make sure that we lay eyes on all of the screens to be able to try to get as full of a picture of an individual as we can. From there, they take those, again, as I mentioned, that they do additional assessments as needed, and then really connect them directly to the areas of need or opportunity they have, whether it be mental health, substance use, co-occurring, housing, uh, whatever it might be. Wonderful, thank you. 
And Lieutenant Gaylord, I'm going to ask you the same. So once those scores are known, how does that work within Charlevoix County Jail? Sure. Um, we uh, have a, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have a uh, partnership with our community mental health and the jail liaison representative. Uh, it's our facility once a week, as well as other uh, jails in their, in their jurisdiction. So for any non-emergent, obviously if it's emergent, we have other processes in place. Um, that individual is added uh, to uh, be seen uh, by him uh, when he shows up. So if we flag it for other reasons or the K-6, they're also added to the list, again, for non-emergent uh, follow-up, et cetera. So mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty fruitful in that regard. And uh, we, we do appreciate the fact that uh, having a standardized tool um, to, to work with so we can, and that's also part of our stepping up group is the data collection and looking at all the partners um, that are involved in the deflection and diversion and how the data fits in. We are but one spoke on the wheel, so to speak. Um, but the, uh, the standardized form was gonna allow us to uh, build uh, data that we can fall back on and reference and have a, a known versus just random information. Thank you, Lieutenant. And then yeah. can you talk about how those scores are used and result in service in your jail? Yeah, so um, we have uh, a couple of clinicians and a peer support uh, located within the, the Monroe County Jail. Um, they are not there currently due to COVID, but uh, so on a normal day, we, um, while we're in the jail, we would have the ability to run those reports on a daily basis, but those reports are also emailed to us um, in a group from the nighttime sergeant on shift. So we can see quickly at a glance uh, the scores from the K-6 that were administered. Uh, any nine or higher uh, uh, we consider positive and then we can, um, we can act and uh, be able to have a contact with those individuals within 24 hours of the business day to assess for further needs. Uh, and it's similar with the RODs too as we're uh, also working on the, um, uh, the OTE process and getting the, the mat within the jail, we're, uh, we're able to uh, respond within 24 hours of a positive ROTS to screen for further uh, needs and wants from that individual. Uh, but there's also, we have like uh, fail safes as well, as I would call them. Because, um, I mean, um, as was mentioned before, you know, when people come into the jail and they're administered the ROTS, they're not always uh, maybe um, as forthcoming with some of the information or, or they might be you know, a lot just happened. Maybe they're they're coming down off of uh, some substance or what have you, um, and so we we also have uh, our office, mental health offices across from the nursing station within the jail. So they're within contact with the individuals as well. If they see something concerning, they can communicate that. We are directly linked to the kite system within the jail. So if an individual has needs that they identify later that they didn't identify initially, they can communicate that to our. Um, mental health staff within the jail. The, uh, the officers within the jail, the corrections officers also use the PHQ-9. So um, that's another tool we use as well for, because we're not always there and we're not always monitoring the kites uh, that come through. The sergeants keep an eye on those all the time. So if there's a concerning kite or an ambiguous kite that comes through that's, that's not clear, they can respond uh, immediately and uh, because they're not trained mental health professionals, they can use the PHQ-9 as a tool to determine um, uh, the severity of the need and, and act appropriately. And then the next business day, the mental health staff can respond and, and do a face-to-face -to, -face to assess further as well. Wonderful, very thorough, thank you. I know that there are sometimes obstacles or challenges in, in implementing the screen. So if any of you can address um, some of those challenges faced and how you overcame those to get the screen in place, whether you're doing it manually or whether you're doing it as part of the JMS, um, what were those challenges and how did you overcome them? Um, for us, you know, I think first and for foremost, um, conducting the standardized screen and, and getting some um, kind of truthful, consistent um, results from folks to make sure that we're able to accurately identify 
um, those individuals is always a challenge just due to the nature of the job and the process and the environment of first coming into the jail. Um, and I think for us, it's really important to make sure that we have properly trained our booking officers in those assessments, not only on the why behind what it is we're doing or what our, our outcome, um, you know, we in, our intended outcome is, but also the how, right? Like, how do you appropriately ask these questions uh, of folks to, to establish a bit of a rapport or a comfort level where they understand um, the need to answer the questions as truthfully as possible um, and that it's for their long-term benefit or help kind of moving forward. So um, for us, when, uh, as I mentioned, transitioning to the K-6, um, it's just as important for us to get it into our jail management system to make it part of the process and be able to collect the data uh, as it is for us to make sure our booking officers are appropriately trained in how to, to ask or implement those screens. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Anything that you'd like to add, Adam or Lieutenant Gaylord? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, um, I, I think we, we had the K-6 implemented for quite uh, some time. And for quite a while, I think we took things for granted. It was pretty seamless. Um, we started to implement the rods and started to remember um, the benefit for having it embedded within the jail management system uh, because the rods was being uh, scored manually uh, um, on a separate sheet of paper. So, we, you know, corrections officer is a very tough job and, and as such, there is some turnover in those jobs. And so uh, with the, the training of new staff and um, new people coming in and, and trying to get everybody on board, you're kind of at the mercy of having making sure each officer is compliant with, uh, with completing each one of those things in addition to the lengthy booking process they're already completing. So uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can say with confidence that having it embedded in the jail management system is a very vital piece that we found because uh, there's no question that there's 100% compliance with the K-6 uh, uh, completions. Um, now that it's in the JMS system, and I have no doubt that it would be the same with the rods once that gets embedded as well. Very good point. Thank you, Adam. And Lieutenant Gaylord, I'm going to close with you. Sure. Uh, when you ask what obstacles, uh, as far as utilizing the form, uh, we didn't have any obstacles. Um, I'm going to brag on my staff uh, for just a quick minute. Um, we have a culture here of everybody that comes into the facility is treating them as a human being, regardless of their situation. So this was just another tool to uh, assist everyone uh, in the roles of corrections deputy here. And, you know, the technical portion of uh, installing it into our new JMS, we're working through that. I'm, I'm on that bill team, so uh, that'll work itself out. But the overall uh, utilization of the K-6, adding another tool uh, for everyone here um, really wasn't an obstacle. So. Okay. I'm sure that's most places. It sounds like my fellow panelists are in that uh, same boat there that everybody's on board and, uh, and truly gets it. So uh, real quick, I know this was our main topic was on the, uh, you know, what forms we're using, but I would be remiss if I didn't comment on the stepping up program overall and our partnership with our community mental health, uh, both uh, the support from Wayne State, um, you know, bringing this, I think one of the biggest things that I observed uh, being on the uh, stepping up committee was everybody that's all the stakeholders, whether it's criminal justice, medical, health department, it didn't matter. Um, everybody dealt with individuals in the same situation in their own world and the ability to see other people and the challenges they went through and also to learn about each of us do, and, and I think there were some myths that were overcome uh, all the way around. So uh, if your community is, your facility is not participating in something up, I'd encourage you to look at it. And just thank you, uh, Liz and staff, uh, for what you've done on that. And and again, our, our community mental health, I, I can't say enough, um, the great working relationship we have on that with, with those folks there and the common goal uh, for mental health version and getting individuals where they need to be. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Gaylord. I really appreciate that. And I know our team does as well. I'm going to turn it over to Lane. I'm sure there are some questions on this panel. So Lane, if you could ask our panelists any questions that have come in. Thank you. 
Yes, absolutely. So a question for all of you. I know some of you mentioned that using these screening tools often results in a lot more people being flagged with a mental health concern. And we, of course, know that often jail mental health resources are really limited. So how do you handle this sometimes large number of positive screens? Is there a way that you triage folks or sort of prioritize folks based on need? And what does that look like in your facility? Um, that is true. We found that to be uh, that found that to be um, something that we did struggle through um, because we would get a lot of referrals. We would have a lot of follow up, and um, for a long time we had one clinician in the jail, and it was pretty overwhelming. Uh, so we we would have to triage, um, and we would obviously prioritize the the higher scores uh, first, and um, those that were exhibiting. Uh, uh, symptoms and behaviors uh, currently. Uh, but we also have a peer support within the jail and that's been very helpful as well. So, um, you know, some of the um, individuals that were um, determined by the screen to be less intense uh, needs, we could have uh, the peer support go and talk to and determine some needs preliminarily to see uh, if there was need for clin clinical follow-up or if it could be resolved with some um, um, just some collaboration or, or, or giving some resources. Um, we, also, we also made sure that with the, the clinical response, the initial screening, uh, we made um, different levels of screenings, uh, implemented different levels of screenings. So the, the first contact, we would try to keep within 10 minutes just to really get a quick and dirty kind of look at what, what's going on and uh, and, and what kind of level of an intervention is going to be needed. And from there, we could respond accordingly, um, but at least to ensure health and safety first and foremost. And then from there, uh, you know, plug in what, what we need to plug in and, and go from there. Yeah, and similarly for us at Washtenaw County, uh, we have an amazing partnership with our community mental health. We actually have uh, five mental health clinicians on staff that work uh, in our jail full time, um, and we do a triage system. So when we do get all of those screens through, we have someone who's immediately taking a look at them, triaging them based off need. If we have certain emergent situations, again, kind of doing that um, full view of an individual from what we might know from prior engagements or other information, and then we move through the assessments in that manner. Um, you know, it ebbs and flows. There are times that we certainly have a higher level or a higher uh, number of, of positive folks that we need to engage with and screen. Um, but uh, we, again, our triage system has proven to be um, fairly effective in, in getting uh, those folks to engage as quickly as possible. Uh, in Cheryl Boy, obviously on the, the panel, I, I represent the small jail. Um, we have the same problems, just less of them. And we have not really run into a problem of uh, services being overwhelmed, um, the individuals that are referred. Uh, so, uh, you know, that again, that has not really been an issue. Uh, CMH, um, they follow through, and, and everybody is seen in, in a timely fashion, uh, not emergent. If it becomes emergent, then we, we follow other processes. but. Um, anybody that's either in the audience or uh, fellow panelists from a smaller facility, you know, resources are not as plentiful as in the metro areas. And I think that's, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, leadership, including my sheriff and uh, the director of the community mental health, uh, are really pushing for uh, like a, a diversion facility uh, to get these individuals where they need to go either pre-arrest or uh, shortly after arrest. So, uh, but until that happens, so uh, we have the, the resources that we have and uh, they per se have not been overwhelmed on getting people looked at and assessed. Great, thank you. Adam, we have a follow-up question for you. You mentioned the peer support in your facility. Someone is asking if you could explain the role of the peer support um, if they are a mental health professional. Yeah, so um, is a mental health professional in the, in the capacity of a peer support role, a certified peer support. Uh, the, the, 
the thing we use the peer support for the most within the GEO is uh, uh, she is the one who largely the triage. So when she comes in, in the at first thing in the morning, her duties include uh, pulling the K6 reports, uh, finding the positive K6s, uh, the positive rods, cross-referencing the K6 with our electronic uh, health record, if there's any crossover there, um, and then uh, answering all of the kites as well. And then um, supplying that information then to the clinical team, and then they meet as a team to be able to um, determine the triage and, and who's going to see who and, and, and how they're gonna tackle the needs of the day. Um, the peer support also is, uh, is, is hugely important in um, helping those um, individuals house the jail that might be having um, you know, higher emotional responses at given times and to be able to talk with them and just let them be heard. Um, she helps with uh, uh, court liaison things as well to be able to just go there and be with people that might have anxiety given their court hearing and, and things. And then she would communicate to any treatment teams in the community that might be involved with the individual's care as well. So um, a lot of duties the peer, we utilize the peer support for. Um, very critical role. We, we appreciate everything that they do um, without a doubt. Great, thank you, Adam. Question for all of you. Have you experienced any downside to using these standardized assessments in the jail? I wouldn't say it's, uh, I commented on it earlier in our uh, session, uh, the K6, and we, this was initially discovered during our, our pilot process and stepping up, was it flagged a, a higher percentage of females and Sometimes the uh, the ability to um, have the uh, the females uh, how should I say monitored um, it can be difficult the uh, because of their sometimes they they really don't want to communicate some other issues with uh, with the uh, what the flag shows. So, um, yeah, I'd say that's about it on that. Thank you. Thank you. I can't say that I've seen any downside. I think the um, the challenge up front was the the influx of referrals that we can mention before. Um, you know, but we've we've figured out a way to navigate that. And also, I would say, you know, I mean, Major Goodenough and his staff are excellent, and and with the continued training and stuff of, of their staff and their ability to recognize uh, mental health needs uh, also helps with that triage process as well. So um, other than that, I don't think that there's really any downside. Yeah, and I would agree. I, I mean, I think once you can get through kind of getting it into your jail management system and making it part of the booking process and then being able to identify how you're going to use those screens and triage them and kind of move forward with the process, um, I wouldn't see there see any other kind of drawbacks or downsides to using these screens. Wonderful. Thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Liz. We can get started with our final panel on time. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam, Renee, and Lieutenant Gaylord. We really appreciate your time this morning. We're going to move to panel number four. Um, and this is warm handoff using boundary spanners for cross-system collaboration. The standard definition of a boundary spanner is a professional who, fil who facilitates system-wide coordination between the criminal legal system and the treatment sector to advocate for and connect those with SMI or SUD to services. Boundary spanners foster communication and collaboration between agencies and focus on key areas that are known to improve outcomes, including diversion and warm handoff from jail to community, which fosters continuity of care. Two key issues currently impact this important role. Oftentimes services provided by the boundary spanners within the jail are not Medicaid reimbursable and often depend on general funds from the CMH. Number two, the hours immediately following jail release are critical and boundary spanners are key to providing that warm handoff from jail to community. So to go without a boundary spanner often means that you're going without discharge planning at that critical time. 
Represented on this panel are key behavioral health stakeholders from our jail diversion pilot counties. As we know, and as evidenced by the data presentation from Dr. Comartin, comparing the aggregate data from jail diversion and stepping up counties, the jail diversion pilot counties have had the advantage of continuous improvements to their processes. The implementation of a boundary spanner is one way in which pilot communities are able to more efficiently identify, refer, and serve those with behavioral health concerns to increase diversion opportunities and to improve continuity of care through that warm handoff from jail to community. Our next panelists all serve as boundary spanners, although sometimes that is not their title within their own counties. They include Dane Beckford from Riverwood Center in Berrien County, Nicole Brunn from Livingston County Community Mental Health, and Lindsay O'Neill from Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. Welcome panelists. I have a couple questions I'm gonna um, start off with, and I, as I indicated, you're not always called boundary spanners, but we know from our work with you that you are serving in that role. So in this, role can vary by jail. So can you describe what your role is in within your jail so that our audience can get a sense of how this varies and what this role can look like depending on the jail that it's in. So I'll start with you, Dane. Sure, good morning. Can morning. you hear me? Good, yes, we can hear you, Dane, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so basically, um, I work for Riverwood so half of my day I spend at the jail and half in the community. Typically, I want to get to the jail the first half of the day because that's the most critical part of the day. And the reason for that is this. Um, generally, they have arraignment at 1.30 in the afternoon. So you want to get to make contact with inmates prior to the arraignment so you can divert them um, to reduce the time they spend incarcerated. So generally what I do is this. Um, I go into the jail first thing in the morning, then I go through the booking report, identify inmates who um, have had history of a mental illness or those who are currently open to Riverwood. Alert from system UI server. And then what I Low do... Low battery. Then what I do is this. Alert from... Low battery. Here. Mm -hmm. oh, Is that your battery, Dane? I hope it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give me a second here. It is. Okay. Sure. Can Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Okay. So, um, when, when after after going through the booking report and identifying these individuals, generally. Um, I make contact with them. And what I mean is I go into a room, meet with them. Um, I do a request for service, which basically is just a needs assessment to find out exactly what I need to do for that individual to get them out. Then I try to make contact with their public defender or the person who is assigned for that day to do the arraignments at the jail. Now, when I make contact with that public defender, um, generally, the goal is to get me into the arraignment, right? So that I can actually speak on their behalf. But this is critical. You have to make sure that you have a plan before you go into the arraignment. And so generally, I want to identify housing for that individual. How is that housing gonna be paid for? Um, make sure that they're gonna receive 24-7 um, monitoring. Um, make sure that they have a case manager who will be monitoring them on a weekly basis. Um, these are some things that the judge will be asking about because they want to make sure that the person is in a safe place. Um, They're gonna get their medications as prescribed and um, that the individual will also have transportation to and from court, All right? So generally that's what I do when I, go in, when, I, when I go into the arraignment and I speak on their behalf, then I arrange, if the judge agrees to release them, then I will make arrangement for transportation for that individual um, to be transported to the adult foster care home. Um, sometimes that is done by myself, um, accompanied by a case manager, or the home will actually come and pick up that individual and take them um, to the facility. 
Wonderful. And Dane, I just have a question. What is your official title at Riverwood? Oh, it's a geodiversion therapist. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank yeah. you. I'd like to um, move to Nicole. Nicole, can you talk a little bit about your role at Livingston County Jail? Yes, uh, thank you. So I'm the jail diversion clinician. Uh, I provide mainly the assessment, um, evaluation, and screening for individuals. Uh, you know, if there's crises, then I'm the one who will come and respond to determine whether the, per the person is eligible for inpatient, um, possible diversion, or uh, maybe other needs that they have in the jail that uh, we can help advocate for. Um, I do the screenings to get them set up with services in the community, uh, whether that's substance abuse or mental health. Uh, and, you know, I think in all, we have three different staff in our program. We have the clinician, a case manager, and a peer support specialist. Uh, and I think we have a lot of overlap between us. Um, I may go in to do a screening with someone, and part of that is doing the discharge planning also, um, doing a lot of that case management type stuff. Um, our peer support specialist, uh, finds herself doing a lot of that stuff. You know, we have a lot of advocacy that we're doing and connecting with the courts and attorneys, um, their providers in the community, if they're already linked up with them or getting appointments set up for aftercare, things like that. Great, thank you for that recap. And I will, I'm gonna circle back to you with a couple of questions I know um, that will be of interest to our audience. I wanna to go to Lindsay and Lindsay, if you can give us a recap of how you operate within uh, Kalamazoo County Jail and also what your official title would be. Yes, so I am the supervisor of the Corrections Recovery Unit at Integrated Services at Kalamazoo. So we are a team of six that I consider all of them to be boundary spanners. We have a peer who works mostly with our mental health recovery court team, as well as a full-time master's level clinician for that team. I have a master's level clinician who is mostly a liaison between um, <clears throat> probation and parole departments. So she is within our probation parole office of community corrections, doing a lot of that boundary spanning and, and referrals um, for people not currently incarcerated, but working um, with community supervision. And then we have two full-time clinicians that are in the Kalamazoo County Jail. So they are, are working and typically get, have individuals identified in kind of three unique ways. Obviously, the typical referrals from jail staff, local law enforcement, um, kind of anecdotal, whether that's through reports or emails. We do utilize the K-6 as an identification tool. And then our last tool that we utilize is an interceptor program, a matching program. It's similar. Um, we've developed it within our own um, medical record program that we take bookings on a 24-hour period and compare them to those open and active in our services and it matches those together. So we get daily a list of individuals who have been booked into the jail or released um, that are identified as current clients within Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. We also get court notifications for them. So that gives us an opportunity that members of our team every day will send notifications to current um, treatment providers, letting them know when someone is in jail, when they're getting out or when their court date is. And that's really kind of expanded our ability to coordinate um, for people already set up with services. Thank you so much. Now, each of you mentioned some collaboration um, that you're regularly engaged with, you know, other providers, certainly uh, the jail staff, but which agencies, when we're talking about diverting or, you know, really advocating as Dane had talked about, which agencies are critical to successfully diverting individuals um, from the jail? reducing jail days, um, so to speak. Um, so I, I know, Dane, that you're doing that, and Nicole, I know that you do that in Livingston, and Lindsay, I, I'm not sure if that's happening in Kalamazoo, but if you could each answer, who are those agencies that you depend on to enable those diversions to occur? So generally, um, I, de I depend on a number of agencies, as you mentioned. Of course, the Sheriff's Department, is very critical. 
Um, I also gen generally coordinate with um, police officers because they're involved also in the process. They generally provide like um, a CIT referral um, for the community. Um, I also, of course, have to make contact with the court, um, public defenders, public prosecutors, um, and oftentimes um, I'll be directly conduct, um, contacted by a judge. Um, um, I also occasionally um, make contact with DHS as well um, in coordinating things for consumers. Wonderful. Thank you, Dane. How about you, Nicole? Yeah, I would say our primary advocacy is uh, with the courts. Uh, we have a lot of contact with their defense attorney. Um, we text them a lot. Uh, they have our cell phone numbers and will text us. Uh, sometimes we have to advocate with the prosecutor's office, uh, but that can get kind of tricky. Um, but there have been occasions where we've had to um, advocate with them directly uh, and the judges. Uh, there have been a lot of times when we're working on a more difficult diversion that we've been called back to their chambers for like a meeting with everyone. Um, so we do, we do a lot of that. Uh, you know, we work with the specialty courts, um, the substance use providers in the community. Um, we don't have to do a whole lot of advocating with them, but uh, sometimes getting information from them about what's been going on with the individual um, so that we know how to properly advocate for them. Uh, working with the local police departments, uh, the sheriff's department, as they mentioned, um, probation and parole. Uh, we have a lot more contact with probation officers usually. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, the nonprofit organizations in the community. Okay, you can definitely see why we're calling you boundary spanners because the number of agencies <clears throat> so far that we've heard in your work is astounding. Lindsay, can you talk about um, who you're working with when you're diverting individuals? Yeah, so as Dane mentioned, it's really important when you go in and present that diversion. Um, to the courts that you have a good plan. So frequently that planning involves our, um, typically our Medicaid mental health providers. So that's us, Integrated Services at Kalamazoo, our access or emergency mental health department to determine if they're not in services, what services those qualify for. We utilize um, various substance abuse programs, but one of our major players is a program, again, within Integrated Services at Kalamazoo called Opio Opioid Overdose Response Program or ORP. You don't just work with opioids, so that, that kind of is deceiving, but they are um, a 24-hour service of peer recovery um, and a master's level clinician, and they are really our kind of navigators for our substance abuse programs in, in Kalamazoo County, whether that's Swimber or whatever they're utilizing. So we rely heavily on them to meet with people to meet that substance abuse piece. They have regular access to our jail. Right now it's telehealth due to COVID. Um, we also work with our housing programs. Um, we have some emergency overnight shelters that are associated with Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. Um, employment programs, including Urban Alliance, uh, the Recovery Institute, which is our community-based uh, peer-run services. So we utilize them quite a bit. Um, we specifically, whether it's a diversion or just somebody who's getting out of jail, we use a reentry form and that actually has 10 about 10 sections that we try and make sure we hit, whether that's mental health, uh, primary care, um, uh, establishment of benefits, DHS, things like that. So we, we try and make sure that we address almost all of those boxes before the person walks out the door. Wonderful. If we can um, quickly, before we go to q and I'm just wondering about any obstacles or barriers that you have faced or currently face in your efforts to successfully divert individuals or to provide them with a warm handoff from the jail to community. So real quickly, if we can go down the row, I'm going to start with you, Lindsay, and we'll move backwards. Thank you. Um, I'd say our biggest barrier is the inability for somebody to have Medicaid while they're incarcerated. And while most 
services we were able, were able to get people set up with that 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 Medicaid piece and the ability inability to use any Medicaid funding in order to provide those services, it can become really difficult for continu continuity of care for providers to continue to work with somebody or to get that set up before they walk out the door. So that's kind of our biggest thing right now. Um, I would say as well as just kind of the timing of it and getting people in, in for services and, and a fast enough rate. We have, again, really good relationships with our access center and can kind of go around some of those roadblocks as far as funding or not having the Medicaid. But if they don't, that's general funds. So it definitely meets a different criteria. Thank you, Lindsay. Nicole. I would say our biggest barriers uh, are, are actually uh, through our prosecutor's office and then our emergency department, our local emergency department. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've been working hard to overcome that barrier. Uh, previously, we would have people automatically uh, released, even if we had petitioned them. Um, and working at CMH and being the one who would do the um, evaluation for hospitalization anyways, um, if I completed the petition in a pre-screen, they would still release the individual without taking much look at them. Um, they were of the opinion that their needs could be met in the jail. Um, they had a really limited understanding of what is actually offered in the jail and how unhealthy of an environment that can be. So uh, we've worked really closely with them. A lot of times walking a petition over to them and sitting with that individual in the emergency room until they're evaluated um, and being able to talk directly with the social worker. So that has helped improve that barrier um, and the prosecutor's office as well. We've had a few uh, situations where the defense attorney and even the judge were on board with the plan to divert um, and the prosecutor was strongly against it because of the charge or concerns about um, them coming back to court. Thank you so much. And then Dane, I'm going to end with you. Uh, biggest obstacle <laughs> barriers. Sure, I, I can give you a few. So um, <laughs> first, um, a lack of housing. Um, Typically, um, a lot of the consumers that I make contact with, they generally, um, of course, are homeless or um, because of their crime, which is generally um, domestic related, um, they cannot return to their previous house, homes. And so now we have to find a new home for them. Um, uh, it becomes difficult because they do, oftentimes they don't have any benefits. And so you don't know how that's gonna continue in terms of payment after you place them in that home. Um, luckily, we, in the grant, we do have um, money set aside um, for the first month or two, um, but we have to make sure that you know, they have some kind of continuity after that and they don't become homeless um, and, and don't have access to medications and transportation and all that stuff. So that is an obstacle. Um, also, um, as Nicole was saying about, you know, prosecutor's office, um, typically the, my struggle is with the prosecutors and some of the judges. Um, they don't really subscribe to the idea or the, the, the premise that there are individuals who actually suffer from a mental illness that can actually lead to irrational decision making that is generally deemed as um, a criminal offense. And so when you're trying to advocate for that individual, um, your ideas are pushed aside and, and, and um, ridiculed and, and it becomes very difficult to divert that individual out of the system. Thank you, Dane. That all of that information is so helpful and I'm hoping that those who are on the call with us today are hearing what those barriers are because as far as we've come, there's still a whole lot of work to do um, to move individuals out of the criminal justice system. Um, Lane, I'm going to turn it over to you for Q&A. Thank you. Okay, we got two questions about how you all handle 
coordinating care and services for folks who reside out of county. Yeah, uh, in Livingston, we provide a lot of that coordination. Um, we just have them sign a release of information uh, saying that it's okay for us to contact those agencies in the other county uh, for individuals who are involved in treatment, especially uh, CMH in other counties. Uh, we will start working with their treatment teams relatively early in their incarceration including just informing them of their incarceration. Uh, so we do a lot of that and really as long as we have the release of information, there's no barriers to that. Yeah, so um, for Barron County, typically if the person is, is not from this county, um, we have what we call a COFER. So basically that involves um, permission from the prior county um, to provide services at Barron County. Um, and, and that takes a process, of course, we have to make contact with that count, with the county officials there to, to make sure that they're willing to, to provide payment for those services. Um, unfortunately, there are times when those individuals may not qualify for COFER. Um, and so at Riverwood, we, we generally try to work with that individual and make sure that they receive some type of services, um, whether it be um, connecting them with other resources that are, that are um, not available at Riverwood or at the jail. Um, and that may include contacting um, like Sacred Heart um, and a number of other um, agencies to ensure that they actually have some type of access to services. For us quickly, we do, we coordinate with other counties if we're aware they're working with other counties or from other counties. Unfortunately, our matching system doesn't pull that information. So we rely on the individual getting flagged for us in different ways. Um, but yeah, with a release of information, we're, we're frequently working with other counties to ensure they're either A, getting the treatment they were getting previously while in jail or making their way back to their county and still ensuring that they're following through with their uh, criminal justice needs here. Great, thank you. Another question that could be for any of you, um, are you or are you aware of anyone else collecting data from the prosecutor's office around things like PR bombs, what charges are most likely to be diverted, et cetera? We personally track that data. We submit that to Southwest Michigan Behavioral Health, um, as well as some other various uh, data collections. Um, it's not in conjunction with the prosecutor's office at all. It is simply us handling that data on our end when we participate in a diversion. Um, for, for us, I know that, um, uh, my supervisor, Gretchen Carlson, she actually keeps a spreadsheet of, of um, the, the people we may contact with at the jail. And of course, she provides that information to, to, to Wayne State um, when needed. Um, and, and we collect that information by me actually completing a, a form for each person I see um, with certain pertinent information on that form so that she can put that into the spreadsheet um, so that you guys can have access to that information. Yeah, we, we track our information, uh, but in terms of uh, all charges through the prosecutor's office, I'm not aware of that. Um, I, I've been asked that question before and um, I'm not sure we had looked into it. I think part of their computer system collects some of it, but I don't know how uh, they necessarily correlate that data and if, how closely they monitor or track it. Great, thank you. Um, another question, and I'm not sure who this will apply to, if any of you, but if, you, if your jails are releasing folks at midnight or during 
um, nighttime hours. How do you handle transportation for those folks to make sure that they are getting to a safe place at release? Um, for us, we do have the opportunity that we can coordinate with the sergeants and with the person's agreement, they can stay until the morning um, and then we'll be there and we are, we're able to coordinate that. Um, if they are leaving in the middle of the night or if we're not aware they're getting released and then that release happens, that's kind of what we're relying on is the ability for someone to stay later. Um, I would say that our jail specifically is really good at identifying those needs and not sending someone out the door that they may have those concerns about and utilizing our emergency on-call service if needed to address that before the person leaves. I know that Barron County Jail in past times used to um, release people during the during midnight, but that, that no longer exists. We only release people in the morning um, for liability issues you know, just to be sure that the person is safe and that they have access to transportation. And that's part of our discharge planning. We ask um, if they have someone that is coming to pick them up um, and offer them that ability to have their release held off until the morning. Uh, our jail is really w willing to work with us. Uh, we just have to let one of the lieutenants know and um, they'll make that change. A lot of times the individual does not want to wait until 8 a.m. <laughs> they, they're ready to go at 12.01. Um, but most of the time they have a ride set up or um, we try and help them get connected with another community resource that might be able to provide transportation like our Stepping Stones Engagement Center. Um, if there's somebody who struggles with a substance use disorder uh, we've connected a few people with them. Um, we've also had some situations where as part of their sentence, the judge actually ordered uh, that they're released after a certain time uh, to allow for them to get more appropriate transportation. Wonderful. Thank you all. I'm going to turn this back to Liz to introduce our final speaker. Thank you so much, Lane, for moderating all the Q&A today. Thank you, Dane, Nicole, and Lindsay for your participation on that panel. And thank you to all of our panelists today. If we could, in this virtual setting, we would give you all a round of applause because we really appreciate the time and the expertise that you've offered to all of us this morning. Um, I would like to turn this over to Milt Mack, State Court Administrator Emeritus and Chair of the Mental Health Diversion Council. Um, welcome, Judge Mack. All right, thank you very much, Liz. And let me just commend you for your role as time czar. Great job keeping everybody on point. And I, I also thank want you. to thank the uh, center. This is a great program, uh, wonderfully done, well, well put together very organized. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presenters. The presenters are outstanding. I mean, what a wealth of information. And it gives tremendous hope for the future that we have that going for us. And uh, let me just say, I, I want to acknowledge Dr. Pinos too, uh, because she has a national reputation as well. In fact, she was in charge of the program in Massachusetts. And uh, when Michigan lured her away, I heard about it from the Chief Justice from Massachusetts, as well as the State Court Administrator. I'm not allowed to go there anymore, at least while they're in office. So uh, anyway, the, the, panels there, the panels covered these four key areas. And I think it just demonstrates that the state, uh, law enforcement, behavioral health, criminal legal system, the courts have to continue, continue to move forward around jail diversion. And uh, the truth is the problem is huge, but it is a solvable problem. And I was really impressed by the Calhoun presentation that uh, of 150 encounters, it led to nine arrests. This is consistent with Miami-Dade. Miami-Dade has had a program in place for some time now. They've trained over 6,000 officers in CIT. And the result has been of the last 10,000 encounters that resulted in about 120 arrests. And, and as a result of their diversion program in Miami-Dade, 
They're closed to jail, saving $12 million a year. Uh, law enforcement officers were not being injured as often, so the workers' comp premium went down. And because uh, persons with mental illness weren't being injured or shot, the bond rating went up. So uh, it was a win-win-win situation all the way around, and people had uh, opportunities to get better. In, in Michigan, we have an advantage in that we're a Medicaid expansion state. Florida's not. So we actually have more resources to work with. And uh, you know, I, I think back to uh, a case we had in Wayne County a few years ago where a young man was charged with a minor crime, misdemeanor of some sort, and uh, came in front of the judge for trial because he'd been held in jail, couldn't make bail. And the prosecutor said, well, judge, if you'll plead guilty, time served. And the defense attorney said, hey, that's a great idea. What do you think? And the defendant asked the judge, well, judge, since I've been in the jail, I've been getting treatment for my mental illness and I feel a lot better. Could I have more time, please? And so the judge said, okay, about 30 more days. And he said, like, just like a Dickens novel, could I have some more, please? She said, how about another 30 days, 60 total? And he said, thank you. Well, that's not the kind of system we want in place to take care of persons with mental illness. And that's why it's so important to have this collaboration across the sequential intercept uh, map. And uh, you know, in addition, to, I mean, I, one of the ideas that came out of this meeting today about the virtual resource, what an outstanding idea. Um, that way you can spread your resources, which are thin to start with, over more areas uh, where they're actually needed at the time. So we have a lot of recommendations uh, out there right now from the Joint Task Force, uh, the CB, HJ and the CARES report, they all provide great ideas for moving forward. So it is kind of ironic that the COVID-19 crisis, along with the governor's order to, uh, that racism is a public health crisis, that this has created opportunities for jail diversion that we didn't have before and people are going to take a better look at. Like for, for example, Wayne County, uh, the jail has capacity for over 2,000 inmates. As of yesterday, there were 810. Uh, that tells you a lot about how much jail capacity we should, we should have. And in fact, in Wayne County, between 2017 and 2019, they spent $82 million housing misdemeanor offenders in the Wayne County Jail. And during that period of time, 40% of the inmates were clients of the Mental Health Authority. Now, think about that. If 40% of the residents of Wayne County spent time in the Wayne County Jail, that'd be 800,000 people. So people with mental illness are overrepresented. Uh, they told a story about a fellow named Charlie Brown. And uh, he had over 50 bookings in the Wayne County Jail at a cost of $230,000. And his offenses were not serious. It would have been cheaper to buy him a house and hire someone to stay there with him. Uh, we simply have to do a better job of reallocating our resources and stop putting people whose problem is mental illness or substance abuse disorder in jail. It's a waste of time. It does not work. So um, I think it's critical that we have this multidisciplinary collaboration and that the change we need, the change we want will only occur if we had that kind of collaboration between behavioral health, law enforcement, criminal justice system, and the civil justice system. Uh, you know, kind of an overlooked area is the probate area. You know, the probate area is an area where you can now, in Michigan's new law on assisted outpatient treatment, it's much easier to get an order for assisted outpatient treatment and keep someone well for the long term, because that's really our goal. Not just to deflect and divert. We want to improve their life so they don't once again come in contact with the criminal justice system. But I will say this, this uh, webinar has given me great hope for the future. But I, I served on the Governor's Mental Health Commission in 2004, and the point we made then was, we are crisis oriented. You know, I'd like to see us go from a crisis oriented model to an urgent care model. The mental health treatment should take to start out when someone is in urgent need of help. 
not not wait till crisis. But that's another argument for another day. But uh, I want to thank the center. This is great, and uh, you guys do great work. The, I'm impressed that this is these ideas and, and this work is spread across the entire state of Michigan. So thank you very much for your work, and I feel great. Thank you, Judge Mack, for those closing comments. We really appreciate your continued efforts in this area. Thank you to all of our panelists, speakers, and attendees at the Jail Diversion Summit. We appreciate your interest, your ongoing support of jail diversion efforts across Michigan. As a reminder, please look for our email next week from the CBHJ. Um, that will include a link for today's video as well as the Q&A document. Stay safe and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Bye-bye.